Good morning. I got to tell you, Donnie was sure glad when he saw that passage of scripture. And I about half expected him to have it memorized when he got up here. <laughs> that text tells us something, I think, about the practice of Jesus and his apostles. Because they weren't at church or in the temple they were just enjoying the Passover supper together. And when they were finished with the Passover supper, what'd they do? They sang a hymn together. And then went out to the Mount of Olives. Just a simple, brief passage of scripture that tells us something that they did. They sang. And we just sang. Do you ever sing a new song? <laughs> we just did. And I think it was new to a lot of us. It kind of sounded like, well, that's the title, so I guess every time you sing it, it's going to be the new song. But what do we do when we sing? That's what I want us to consider this morning, because this is a very important aspect of our worship. Not because we've decided it, but because God has decided it. And what part does music play in our lives? What would happen right now if, if some way, some means, music was stricken from our lives from this point on? That's just too horrible to think about. Music is in everything. And when you hear a little child sing, what does it do for your heart when you hear a, a child singing a song? It's just fantastic. And when a movie comes out, if it's a good movie, and sometimes even if it's not a good movie, what does everybody rush down to the store to get but the soundtrack? And half the time when you're watching a movie, you don't even pay any attention to the soundtrack. But have you ever watched any piece of film work that didn't have a soundtrack and you go, what, what, something's missing. And if you're careful about it, you can always tell what kind of thing is about to happen based on the music they play. It's interesting the impact that music has in our lives and in our culture, but especially on a spiritual level. Now, if I were to ask you what passages of scripture do you think of when you think about singing, probably... All of us, at least those of us who are, are long-time members, quote-unquote, of the Church of Christ, probably go, oh, Ephesians 5.19. Let's go to Ephesians 5.19, see what it has to say. And, of course, it's in a context greater than just that verse. So let's back up and get some of that context. This is Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to start at verse 15. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15. Remember, this is a letter that the Holy Spirit is inspiring Paul to write to the church that's in the city of Ephesus. And Ephesus was a tough town. This is the place. I know I've reminded you of this before, but I'll remind you again. This is where Paul was, and the people got in the arena upset over his preaching because his preaching of the gospel was taking away from the money they were making by selling idolatrous shrines and trinkets. And so for two hours they cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. It wasn't even a song. It was just a statement that they made for two hours straight. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. That's the kind of town that this congregation's in. And Paul is writing this letter to them. And here's what he says, starting in chapter 5 and verse 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He says to be wise and understand what the will of the Lord is. So apparently we can understand the Lord's will. He then says, do not get drunk with wine for that is dissipation. Marvelous word, dissipation. We use it all the time, don't we? You go in the hospital and the nurse points out dissipation. Just a doctor. Just a... Okay. It's not what it means. Dissipation is, is when you scatter things that don't need to be scattered. It's like, sometimes Debbie goes off for a weekend. Why are you laughing? And I don't know how the rest of you bachelors do it, but I, I go in and I fix myself a sandwich, and there's really not any need to put everything away that I've gotten out to fix a sandwich because I know I'm going to do that later. 
And then I go in the living room to take care of some task I've got in the living room, and I get stuff out to take care of that task in the living room. And there's not any reason to put stuff away because I know I'm going to do that later. And then I go in the bedroom to do something, and in the garage, and out in the yard, and everywhere I go, I leave stuff out because I'm going to get to that later. And what I have done is dissipation. I've just kind of pulled everything out and scattered it. Nothing's in place. That's what Paul is saying here. When you get drunk, you're scattering the good things that God has given you. He says, don't be unwise, but be wise. Understand what the will of the Lord is. And then he says this, be filled with the Spirit. And where the Spirit of God is, there is order. That's what he's talking to us about. Let's bring order to our lives. Be filled with the Spirit of God, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So in this context of teaching the church how to behave and to be wise, not unwise, to understand the will of the Lord, he says, let yourself be filled with the Spirit of God. Now, there's, a, there's another text that I want us to read together with this. It's from Colossians. Colossians chapter 3 where he says almost the same thing, but it's just a little bit different. Colossians chapter 3, look at verse 16. We'll just look at 16 this time. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now what did he say in, in Colossians 5? He said, let the spirit of Christ. And here he says, let the word of Christ. I'll tell you this, if you've got the word of Christ in you, that's the word of the spirit. And you can't let the spirit of God dwell in you unless you have the word dwelling in you. It comes by means of information. And somebody says, well, how does, how does that spirit work? I'll confess to you what we just talked about in class, in our Romans class. I don't even know how my own spirit works. Do I have one? Yes, I believe I've got a spirit. Where is it? Is it in my head? Is it in my heart? Is this my heart? Well, that's the muscle that pumps the blood. But what is the human heart? What is the human mind? I, I don't know. But I know I've got a spirit. And I know that from time to time it's affected in, in various ways. From the reading of the word and from prayer and from watching the news and from seeing people interact with one another and from things I do and say, sometimes good, sometimes wrong. My spirit is affected by all this. So I know I've got a spirit, but I don't know exactly how it works. And I don't know exactly how the spirit of God works. But I know if I want the spirit of God to be in me, I need to get in the spirit's word. I need to get in this book. I need to learn this. I need to understand this. Just like Paul said in Ephesians. Don't be unwise, but be wise. Understanding what the will of the Lord is. Let the Spirit of God dwell in you richly. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And let it rule your hearts. He says in verse 15. Now in verse 16, he says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Same thing he said in Ephesians, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. The Bible comes with its own songbook. Did you, you understand that? You really, that's what the psalms are all about. And it's interesting to me that, that when God gives us a songbook, so to speak, he didn't say we have to be limited to those psalms. But there they are. And he didn't give us, along with that, a book filled with prayers. So you got to read out of the prayer book if you want to pray. He didn't do that, did he? But he gave us a book filled with psalms. Who wrote most of the psalms? You probably know this. David. David is the one man in all of Scripture of whom it says he was a man, how? After God's own heart. And so the one man who is after God's own heart is the one who's written most of the psalms that are in this book. And God says, I want my people to sing. I want them to sing psalms, but also hymns. A hymn is just a spiritual song of praise. That's really all it is. Nothing complicated. And spiritual songs. We know that there are psalms that speak to us of spiritual 
concepts, spiritual ideas, spiritual truths. And we sing these psalms. We've been singing them all morning, haven't we? We sang when we got here a wonderful song. What's that song about? Well, it's, it's essentially a celebration of the fact that Jesus is in our lives and he's doing us good. A wonderful song, he is to me. He is the song. And as we live our lives in Christ, we, we sing that song. It's an expression of our faith. Beneath the cross of Jesus, we sang, what do we always say about those songs? Well, in preparation for the Lord's Supper, what are we preparing? Our minds. Why am I pointing to my brain? Because I think that's where my mind is. I don't even know if that's where my mind is. Haven't your parents ever asked you, where's your mind, son? I don't know, Mom. But we prepare our minds, we prepare our hearts, sometimes they say, for the Lord's Supper. Well, how do we do that? With words that convey, convey ideas, spiritual thoughts, truths that sink in. Sometimes they just remind us of what we know is true. They're not giving us any new information necessarily, but they bring us back to something that's old. And a marvelous thing about that is sometimes when we come back to things that are old, and rethink what's old, we come up with new thoughts about things that have been old to us for a long time. That's just the way it works. It's marvelous that way. But this is what we're being taught to do. And think of it in terms of these letters being written to congregations. And what they did in the first century is probably just exactly what we would do. They read these letters. Hey, we got a letter from Paul. Oh, fantastic. Go back in the office and make me a copy, will you? Didn't work like that. If you wanted a copy, you had to write it down yourself. You had to look at it and say, oh, he says, uh, uh, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Write that down. They didn't have chapters. They didn't have verses. Those came along a lot later. But when they had letters, they generally read those letters to the congregation. Paul would even write that later. When you get this letter, you read it to the congregation. And then you read the congregation letter that got from the other congregation. That's how they did it. So imagine you're sitting there in the assembly of the church and you're hearing this letter and in this letter you're being taught to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And as the word of Christ dwells in you richly, sing to one another. How do you do that? Well, you make melody in your heart. Just in your heart? No, there's singing. You actually make a noise with your mouth. And I want to encourage you, no matter who you are and what talent or lack of talent you think you have, I want to encourage you that God is teaching us and encouraging us to sing, to make a noise. What have we heard from the Psalms? Make a joyful noise. And sometimes that's all it is, is a noise. But if it's joyful, God wants to hear it. Who gave you your voice? God knows what he gave you. He knows what he's asking for. It's kind of like to me when you... And you go in any grandparent's home and look on your refrigerator, their refrigerator, what are you going to see? You're going to see the Mona Lisa. No, you're not. You're going to see something and you're going to go, what is that? But you'll know what it is. That's artwork from a four-year-old. It's indiscernible as far as what in the world it is. But why is it on the refrigerator? Because that's precious to a grandparent. Why does God ask us to sing? He knows what he gave us as far as voices goes, and he wants us to lift up our voices to him. That's why we're getting this, but it's not, it's not just for him, it's for us. Teaching one another, we know what teaching is, admonishing one another. What's an admonishment? That's simply a, a loving warning. Admonishing one another, better clean your room, my mom would say, a loving warning. What's coming after the loving warning? The less than loving warning, if you're lucky. <laughs> Songs are such an integral part of our lives on a regular basis, but now God is making singing, not just songs, not just music, but he's making singing as something that he wants to be part of our lives on a regular spiritual basis. And so we, we do this. I don't have that good a voice. I've said before, I'll say it again, my voice is kind of like an onion. 
go down to the store and get onions and then just eat an onion. But you know, if you put that onion with some other vegetables, it's not so bad. As a matter of fact, it tends to enhance the flavor of the other vegetables. And maybe that's the kind of voice you've got. Or maybe you've got a garlic voice. But you know, you start doing a little research, you find out one of the best things for us is garlic. Maybe what we need in this congregation is to hear people singing who sound horrible. I mean, if you went to the voice, they'd probably, eh, all four buzzers, eh, no, sorry. But to God, well, he wants to hear that. That's why he says, he, he doesn't say, sing and make melody in your heart if you got a good voice. Didn't read that. Now, I'm not saying this to, to castigate anybody or, or to, to punish anybody, make anybody feel bad. I'm, I'm saying this to encourage you that whatever you've got by way of a voice, let God hear it and let everybody around you hear it. Because that's what God gave, us, gave it to us for. I want to take a look at some of the songs. I don't know if these are favorites of yours, but some of them are favorites of mine and just see... What are we singing when we sing these songs? Amazing Grace, number 129, if you want to look at it in your songbook. And right above number 129, Amazing Grace, is the story of Amazing Grace. Story about John Newton. It says, at age 11, John's mother died. And his father took him off to sea. On a visit back home, he was impounded by the Navy. That means the Navy grabbed him up, young man. Pressed him into service, he escaped from the Navy, only to be impounded again. But this time, the Navy traded him into a slave trader, and he became involved in the slave trade and gross immorality. He was eventually imprisoned and then rescued by a friend of his father. In 1748, says he boarded the Greyhound, another ship, headed for home, but encountered a terrible storm on the way, and after 27 days of being lost at sea, the crew finally sighted land. This experience drove Newton back to the faith, taught at his mother's knee, and he became a preacher. And the fire that was now lit would never again be extinguished. At age 82, near death, almost blind and with fading memory, he spoke these words. My memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things. I'm a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. John Newton still lives on, and this the world's best loved him. Look at the words. Verse 1. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Does that describe you? Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. Grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Do you remember that first hour, that first realization? My sins are forgiven. I'm cleansed by the blood of Christ. This is the amazing grace. I want to remind you today, if you don't already know it, that you're just as clean today as you were on that day. You don't get dirty along the way. The blood of Christ continually cleanses us because it's amazing grace. It's not grace that used to be or one-time grace. It's amazing grace that keeps on cleansing us. That's what John says when he writes 1 John chapter 1. The blood of Christ, as we walk in the light, cleanses us from all our sin. Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Tis grace, as grace has brought me safe thus far. Grace will lead me home. And then it says this. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Often when we sing the other version of this amazing grace, we only sing the first, or the first line and then we kind of let the song go. And I, I think that might be because we're not thinking through the words of the song. We'll sing... When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, and then we stop the song. What? A newcomer who's actually paying attention to the words would say, well, what? What do you mean? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. Where's the rest of that? Oh, we didn't sing it. Let's sing it. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Amazing grace. That what faith we can put in God for the little while here will bring us into eternity that will never end. Well, that's just one song. There's another one. This is my favorite. Give me the Bible, number 450. 
Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wanderer lone and tempest-tossed. It's interesting when you read that first line, you can almost go back to Newton's life. The wanderer, lone and tempest-tossed, out there on the sea in the slave ship, taking part in that horrible immorality that he did and later coming to find life and grace in Christ. No storm can hide that radiance peaceful beaming since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible when my heart's broken. That's when it really counts, doesn't it? When sin and grief have filled my soul with fear, even if it's your own sin, give me the Bible when my heart's broken. Give me the precious words by Jesus spoken. Hold up faith's lamp to show my Savior near. Give me the Bible, lamp of life immortal. Hold up that splendor by the open grave. And I don't know what grave the author meant. Probably the grave of Christ. But when I first thought about this line, I thought of my own grave. Hold up the splendor of the word of God by the open grave. I know I'm going to a grave eventually, so what? Because of the word of God, I don't look at my future grave with fear. As a matter of fact, I'm kind of looking forward to it. You read 1 Corinthians 15, it says, This body, that's fading fast, believe you me, this body is seed. And on the resurrection, this body will become seed, and their life be coming up from this old body that's going to be more glorious than I could ever imagine. That's, that's 1 Corinthians 15. So when I read this, I, I think, well, it could be the grave of Christ. Hold up that splendor of the Bible by the open grave where Christ is resurrected from the dead. Or it could be in my own future grave. Maybe it's both. Can it be both? Why not? Yeah. I know I think about both now when I sing this song. It puts those thoughts in my mind. Show me the light from heaven's shining portal. Show me the glory, gilding Jordan's wave. And of course that allusion to Jordan is, but you cross the Jordan to get where? The promised land. We're going to the promised land. And when you come up to the Jordan, don't be afraid. When they crossed, the, the, the Jordan River was at flood stage. They weren't afraid of the flood. They weren't afraid of the raging water. They were going across to the land of promise from God and he was going to part those waters just like he parted the Red Sea. That's how they went through. That's, all this imagery comes forth when you read songs like this. There's another one I think we should look at. It's number 695. 695. And the reason I wanted to look at this is because... This is one of the most, uh, I'll say, self-introspective songs I think there is in the book. In other words, this one really makes me look at myself and probably makes you look at yourself too. Because it starts out, Oh, the bitter pain and sorrow that a time could ever be when I proudly said to Jesus, All of self and none of thee. Then we get to the second verse. Yet he found me, I beheld him bleeding on the accursed tree, and wistful, my wistful heart said faintly, Some of self and some of thee. Verse 3, day by day the tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free, brought me lower while I whispered, less of self and more of thee. And then the fourth verse, oh boy, this is the challenging verse. Higher than the highest heavens, deeper than the deepest sea, Lord thy love at last is conquered, none of self and all of thee. What are you thinking about yourself when you make that claim? Is it wrong for us to sing the fourth verse if we know, man, I, I don't do that very well. I, I'm still pulling back to some of self. I might make it to verse 3 if I just kind of cheat a little bit. But verse 4, I don't know. Are we going to quit singing verse 4? What happens when we sing a song like this? I don't think the thing to, to focus on is whether or not we're singing accurately what we're actually doing. I think what we should focus on is what value are we teaching ourselves when we sing a song like this. We know this is the right way to do it. None of self and all of thee. We know that's right. We know that's what we want. That's the spiritual apex that we're, we're moving towards. 
And that's a value we should all have. Woe be unto us if we ever become satisfied with singing only verse 3. Let's always sing verse 4 and then set ourselves on that path. Hold it up before yourself. That's the value. That's what you want to do. Even if that's not what you're doing, that's what you want to do. That's what's right. Another one. Verse 662. Oh, boy. All to Jesus I surrender. Just the title makes me a liar. How about you? All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. Except for a few things noted in the footnotes below. It's kind of what we'd like to think. I will ever love and trust Him. In His presence daily live. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me Jesus, take me now. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessings fall on me. Unless it's something you need me to do that's not very comfortable. Or unless it's something you need me to do that I'm not quite sure how to do it. Unless it's something you need me to do that I know there's other people who could do a better job than me. Should we stop singing this song too? No. Keep singing it. If we keep singing songs like this, if we keep holding these kind of values up in front of our own minds and filling our, our mouths with these words that come from the heart as we read these things, we're going to start living these truths out just a little more and more and more and more. Don't wait until a song is true in your life for you to sing every word. Don't feel like it's making you a liar. Sing it out because you know it's the right thing. Sing it out because you're offering up in song a value that God would have you to offer up. Just a couple more. Unto Thee, O Lord, is a song we sing. Uh, I'm sorry, number 63, I will call upon the Lord. Unto the Lord is another one. I, I thought about several of these songs. Some of them we might call camp songs or Devo songs. Because, you know, camp songs and Devo songs, they're not as important as the ones that are actually in the book that are regular church songs with a four-part harmony. Sometimes we think like that, though, don't we? But i got to tell you, a couple of songs that have carried me through hardship and difficulty, when my heart was broken, a little song that I, I sung to myself when nobody else was around about God and His existence. Don't try to tell me that God is dead. He woke me up this morning. Don't try to tell me He's not alive. He lives within my heart. He opened up my blinded eyes and set me on my way. Don't try to tell me that God is dead. He just talked with me today. Just a little bitty song like that. And for you, there'll be a song that'll stick in your mind and it'll stick in your heart and you'll, you'll hold on to that in difficult times and you'll sing that song. And that's what James said. He said there's a time to pray and there's a time to sing. And we know there are songs that fit all these different situations. Number 63, I will call upon the Lord. It's from the 18th Psalm. I will call upon the Lord who's worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. How are you going to be saved from your enemies? By calling on the Lord. Lord help. The Lord lives and blessed is a rock. What does the idea, the imagery of a rock give you? Strong. Nobody's going to shake you if your help is the rock. What did Jesus say about his word? You live this word out in your life, you're going to be like a man who built his house. Where? On the rock. This is from one of those psalms that God had put in the book for us. The Lord lives and blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I'm going to call on the Lord for these very reasons. One last song let's look at. Oh, this is everybody's favorite. Number 753. 753. Is this anybody's favorite song? Usually I see the title or I think of the title and I think, Farther along we'll know all about it. It just, oh man. It's almost like it's for funerals. But look at the words. Look at the words. Don't, don't give a good song down the road because the music isn't what we might want it to be. 
tempted and tried, we're oft made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. Who in here has not ever felt like that? While there are others living about us never molested, though in the wrong, haven't you ever thought that, wondered that? Faithful till death, said our loving master, a few more days to labor and wait. Toils of the road will then seem as nothing as we sweep through that beautiful gate. When we see Jesus coming in glory, when he comes from his home in the sky, then we'll meet him in that bright mansion. We'll understand it all by and by. It's almost better to read it without the music. <laughs> but it's fantastic, the message that this song has. And it's so true to life. So many things happen and we don't know why. We don't know how. We don't know the purpose. But we'll understand it all by and by. We're going to stand in just a little bit and we're going to sing a song of encouragement, we call it. Have you been to Jesus? It's a question. What's the next line of the song? For the cleansing power. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? This is a song of teaching. This is a song of admonishment. This is a song of encouragement, which is exactly why we sing it, to encourage people to respond. We want to teach, we want to encourage, we want to friendly or lovingly warn you this morning, if you haven't been to Jesus for the cleansing power, we're going to sing. And in the singing, we're going to be evangelists. Are you an evangelist? You will be when you sing this song. And if you're subject to its question to answer, come on down and let us help you as we sing it together for you. Let's stand and sing.